So to start to get into today's content, uh, so far we've been talking a lot about few shot learning by using meta learning. And uh, the problem set up for this was we were given data from some number of training tasks and we wanted to quickly solve a new task more quickly, more proficiently or more stably. And we overviewed a few different methods for doing that, black box meta learning methods, optimization based meta learning methods, and non-parametric methods. Uh, and one big assumption that these algorithms make is that you have access to a set of training tasks. Uh, and there may be scenarios where you don't have a, a large number of training tasks, and so that's really the motivation for the lectures that we're going to be talking about, and the topics we're going to be talking about this week. Um, and in particular, we're going to be considering scenarios where you only have one large batch of unlabeled examples, and we want to kind of pre-train models that allow us to perform well with small amounts of data, perform well on new tasks with small amounts of data by pre-training on this unlabeled data. Um, and so in particular, uh, this week is all about unsupervised representation learning, uh, and the lecture today will be on one class of methods for doing that, which is called contrastive learning, and the lecture on Wednesday will be another class of methods for doing that, which are methods based off of reconstruction. Um, and at the end of this lecture, I'll talk about um, kind of, it should be apparent as we kind of go through the lecture, but I'll also talk about how these methods relate to meta-learning methods. Uh, it actually turns out that there is actually a pretty close relationship between the methods that we'll talk about today and the methods that we've actually already been talking about for the past two weeks. Cool. Um, so the goals for the lecture are to understand contrastive learning, including the intuition, design choices, and how to implement them, and how these algorithms relate to better learning. Cool. Um, so unlike meta-learning, uh, the main data that we'll have access to in unsupervised pre-training is a large unlabeled data set. And so that will have a large set of examples denoted as XI without their corresponding labels. And the goal of this unsupervised pre-training process is to take this unlabeled data and produce a pre-trained model such that when we take that pre-trained model and fine tune it on a much smaller labeled data set, we can do well on our new task. Um, so you can in many ways think of this as the same setup as the meta-learning algorithms you've seen before, except instead of having access to a large number of tasks, we have access to this diverse unlabeled data set. And then what we'll be talking about this week is this first arrow on the slide here, where um, how do we basically go from that diverse unlabeled data set to a pre-trained model? Um, the unlabeled data set could be uh, a bunch of images that you found on the internet. It could be a bunch of sentences or text. Um, it could also be um, something more domain specific, like if, um, if you're in an education domain, maybe it's a lot of student solutions to a problem, but you don't have feedback or labels on those solutions, uh, things along those lines. Cool. And so uh, today we'll be talking about contrastive learning for unsupervised pre-training. And really the key idea behind contrastive learning is that we want to learn a representation uh, and specifically a mapping from inputs to a vector representation such that similar examples have similar representations. So examples that are semantically related to one another should map to, a, like, map to points in space that are closer than uh, examples that, have, that, that are semantically different from each other. Um, and so for example, uh, maybe you have two examples with the same class label. Uh, we want to learn a representation space such that these examples have a, a very similar representation. Of course, if we did something like this with um, examples with class labels, we actually would need labels uh, for those examples in order to train those examples to have similar representations. Uh, and this is very closely related to things like Siamese networks and prototypical networks, where we are training a network to predict whether or not two examples had the same class label or whether they had different class labels. Um, and so, yeah, the stuff that we talked about on Wednesday last week in some ways can be viewed as a form of contrastive learning, um, but it requires labels. And so what we want to do is think about how we might do something like that without access to labels. And so there's a few different things that we could imagine doing. 
um, in particular, a few different ways that we could imagine creating examples that might be semantically similar to one another. Um, one thing that we could do is we could take an image and say that patches of that image that are nearby to one another probably should have a similar representation uh, because if they're nearby to each other, that means that they're probably maybe from the same object or from a, a similar part of the same object. Um, and so that's what was done in, in the CPC paper. They tried to encourage those patches to have a similar representation. Um, instead of taking patches of an input, we could also augment an example. Uh, and so in this case, we could take our image and then we could flip it and also crop it and say that the augmented example should have a similar representation as the original example. Uh, and if your, aug if, your augmentations ex um, if your augmentations preserve the class of the image, then this should produce representations that, are, uh, that correspond to the kinds of semantic categories that you may want it to correspond to. Um, so something like this is, uh, was done in the SimClear paper. Um, there's also a version of this where we could take videos and say that images that are nearby in time from the same video should have a similar representation. Um, and so really the key idea behind contrastive learning is to take um, things that we intuitively think should have similar representations, encourage them to have similar representations um, such that we can then use that representation space in order to do uh, transfer to different downstream tasks. Cool, so then there's a the question of um, how do we actually implement this intuition in practice? So um, we can use a running example of trying to say that like the two images at the top have similar representation and the two images at the bottom have similar representations. Um, now one thing you could do is you could say that maybe the, the first image is X, the second image is X prime, and you could train for a model F that encourages the representation of the first image and the representation of the sec second image. We could basically encourage this to have, to be kind of very close, maybe in Euclidean space or in, in um, in some other space. And we could basically optimize for our representation functions such that these are close together. Um, now, does anyone see kind of a problem with an objective like this? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so there's a degenerate solution to this loss function, which is to basically just map everything, all of the images, to a single constant vector. And then you would minimize this loss function very nicely because uh, you, uh, you would achieve zero loss here. But it means that you don't get a very good representation space. And so um, we can't simply minimize the difference between these representations because, uh, because of that collapse. And instead of only comparing examples and saying that examples should have similar representations, we also need to say what needs to be different. We need to also contrast the, the images as well. And so that's one of the key ideas behind contrastive learning. Um, and so in particular, uh, if we take these three examples here, we have our embedding space. Then we could try to train for our embedding space um, in a way that first embeds these examples and then brings together the representations of similar examples while also pushing apart the representations of different examples. Um, and so, this is basically the key idea behind contrastive learning. And from here, there's really just only two key design choices behind these algorithms. Um, the first is how do you actually implement the loss function? Uh, we'll go over two different loss functions in this lecture, but there's actually a number of loss functions that people have used in practice. Uh, and then also choosing what to compare and contrast. Um, we talked about some options at the very beginning um, with the pictures of the dogs, but there's other, um, other considerations there as well. Cool, so let's first get into the kind of implementation of the loss function for contrastive learning. So um, the first, um, I guess in terms of first some terminology, um, if we want to bring two examples together and push apart two examples, typically we'll refer to the first example as the anchor, because um, that's what we're going to be comparing and contrasting to. And then we'll refer to the next example as a positive example, and the third example is the negative. So the we're trying to bring the positive towards the anchor and push the negative away from the anchor. 
Uh, and really the simplest form of loss function is uh, referred to a triplet loss. And we can start by just taking the loss function that we wrote down before, and then instead of only minimizing the distance between um, the embedded x and x prime, we can also add a term that uh, basically maximizes the distance between, um, and we actually using the notation here, we'll call this x plus, that will also maximize the distance between uh, the embedded x and the negative. So this would correspond to uh, f theta of x minus f theta of x minus squared. Um, and because we have a negative here, we're going to be maximizing this distance when we minimize this overall objective function. Yeah? You have a bunch of like, k classes that you want to contrast again. Would you just extend this loss function for all the different classes or just include the length? Yeah, so the question is, um, what happens if you actually have a lot of different negatives that you want to contrast against? Uh, and we'll get into that actually after, after this slide. Yeah? Is there a way um, so that you can control how much you push away uh, contrast? Yeah, so the question is, is there a way to control how much you push away from the contrasting examples? And there's actually two different aspects of that question. One is that maybe for some examples you want to push away more than others. Uh, and in practice, contrastive learning algorithms will push away the same amount for all of the negatives. Uh, but that doesn't mean that all of them will end up at the same distance, because some of them will naturally be harder to push away than others. Um, and so oftentimes, even if you push apart all of them the same amount, they will, um, they'll still give you kind of a meaningfully, the distances in the space will be meaningful. Um, but the second part of that question is that there's actually an issue with this loss function to some degree, um, which is that uh, this term of the loss function uh, is, is somewhat unbounded, uh, which is that you can kind of basically put this to infinity. You can make them like maximally far apart. Um, and so when designing, um, either your embedding function or your loss function, you need to make sure that it, you don't have an unbounded loss function, otherwise it will go to negative infinity. Um, and there's a few different ways to, to accomplish this. One thing that you could do is you could make sure that your embedding space is normalized in some way, is, is bounded itself. Um, but one thing that's common to do with a triplet loss is to um, actually use a, a hinge loss here, which is that instead of um, kind of rewarding it more and more, the more that it pushes away, it says that once it's a certain distance away, then it no longer gets rewarded for pushing it any further. Um, and so you probably have seen something like a hinge loss in, um, in like a machine learning class before. Um, the, the way it looks like is we, if we look at um, the, um, the distance, we want to, um, in this case, or, or the kind of the difference of these distances, Basically, um, as this increases, we want it to get a lower loss. So the, the, the y-axis here is going to be the loss value. Um, so as it increases, we want it to get a lower loss. But at some point, we want it to not um, continue getting rewarded because it doesn't need to push it all the way to negative infinity. And so what a hinge loss would do is um, basically give you a shape that looks like this, um, where up until some point, it's going to be rewarded for increasing the distance. And after that, it will be um, it will just sit at zero loss. Uh, and this kind of, this distance right here is referred to as your margin. Uh, and this is something that you can control. This is like a hyperparameter. And this controls how much you are, how, how far apart you want your examples to be. Um, and so the way that you actually uh, will implement this is um, instead of having your loss function be the, dis the difference between these two things, you're going to, um, first you will um, add your margin. Maybe your margin is referred to as epsilon. Um, and then you will basically bound this below by zero. And so you can take the max between this um, and zero. And this will basically just apply this function to, um, to what we had before. And then we'll minimize this whole thing with respect to theta. Um, and so 
that loss function is written out right here. Yeah. Uh, it is it the x x plus x minus confound uh, the same mini batch? I mean, I, I don't know how we I mean, loop over the triple x x plus x x minus here. Yeah. So the question is, where do x x plus and x minus come from? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, they can come from, these, these triplets can come from a number of different places. Uh, the, in one case, it could, if you have labels, then it could come from the, um, whether or not examples have the same label. So you could sample two examples with the same label and one example with a different label. And that would give you an anchor, a positive and a negative. Um, one of the other things that we talked about is instead of using uh, class labels, you can also use augmentations. And so you could sample an example and sample a different example. Um, that will be the anchor and the negative. And then to get another positive, you can augment and create another view of the anchor by, for example, cropping, applying a random crop or flipping the image or doing something like that. We deal with one mini, mini batch. Yeah. So it means all of them from the, the same mini batch is not understood, correct? Um, so in practice, you'll sample a mini batch of these triplets. Uh, and the so you'll sample. Um, You'll sample not just one triplet, but you'll sample a mini batch of them. Okay. Is it for each one, each of the element in the mini batch, we choose the anchor? Then calculate the x plus and x minus relatively. Then yeah. So, so yeah, to sample an anchor, you can basically um, when you sample an image from your unlabeled data set, that can be the anchor. You sample a different image, and that can be the negative. And then to generate the positive, you can um, augment the anchor to get the positive. So we'll also run through an algorithm too, um, which should maybe give a little bit more intuition for this. Yeah. Um, what if I, uh, negative examples are accidentally included in the same class as like the anchor, or from the same class as the anchor? Um, how bad is that in like the training process? Yeah, so the question is, um, what happens if the negative example is accidentally kind of the same class as the anchor? Uh, and this is generally a great question. Um, and in, in practice, especially when you have unlabeled examples and you're contrasting against augmentations, uh, you will sample negatives that may actually be somewhat similar to the example, that the anchor that you sampled. Um, this is OK. Uh, the most important thing is that, um, well, the, the most important thing is that the that happens somewhat rarely. And so if you, general, if you have a really huge data set, um, the and, and you just want to kind of uh, yeah if you if you have a huge data set then the uh, the number of examples that you have from a particular class will be somewhat small and the likelihood of actually an anchor and a negative being very similar to each other um, will also be small. Yeah. Does the choice of the embedding space and the distance metric make a big difference to the results here? You might imagine that if you that in some non-Euclidean space, you can get different combinations of distances. And I'm wondering if that's helpful. So you're asking, does the distance function here, is that important? Or you're asking something different? Uh, I guess I'm asking that. Like how, how, how helpful it is to do that. Yeah, I think that th there's really two common choices. One is to use Euclidean, and another is to use um, kind of basically negative cosine similarity. Uh, I. To my knowledge, it's not um, it's not critical, and, and um, you, you probably want to consider both of those two options. But beyond that, I don't think that people get super creative. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing that's is different here is that these positives and negatives are they're actually quite different from a class label. Um, and they, they may not correspond exactly to your class labels. Um, they're going to instead correspond to some, some other um, kind of notion of, of relatedness and so forth. Um, sorry, what was your question? So could you give an example other than augmentation? Uh, how do we know in an unlabeled data set whether we just wanted to work? Yeah, so I'll go back to the slide that I had here. So augmented versions are the top right. Um, beyond that, there's um, I have two other examples here. One is to use image patches, or to use basically, um, in this case, they actually often use overlapping image patches from the same image. Um, or if you have a video, you can use nearby frames. Uh, and these are also 
somewhat popular choices as well. Um, in computer vision, augmented versions is like the definitely the most popular example of this. Um, but using things like basically things that are nearby in some space, either in image space or in time or something else, is also uh, very popular. I guess to also provide some intuition for that, for example, with video frames, um, kind of the, the intuition there is that things that co-occur in time will be related to one another, um, but it does end up being fairly data dependent. And if your data, um, if your data for whatever reason doesn't, um, doesn't obey that, like if you have videos that are constantly changing over time um, and, don't, and like are, are more random in terms of their sequence, then that may yield representations that aren't as good as something that has a little bit more temporal coherence. Yeah. Yeah, so you can view augmentations essentially as a form of hyperparameter or as a form of domain knowledge that's going into the algorithm. And the choice of augmentation is actually really, really important to actually how the performance ends up, of these algorithms ends up being. Uh, and there's actually a, a lot of literature on different forms of augmentations that work well for, um, often for, for images. Uh, and there's also some work outside of computer vision domains that, that look at other augmentations as well. Um, but it does end up being quite important. Um, and so if you look at, for example, um, the SimClear paper, I know that they included a study of different kinds of, basically how well different kinds of augmentations work. Or like you kind of discover good augmentations in our learning? Um, there is actually a paper that discovers augmentations, and I'll, I'll, I'll cover it later in the lecture. Cool. Um, so we've talked about the triplet loss, um, and so that's what we went over on the board. Uh, and this is really the simplest form of contrastive loss, uh, and it, it actually works pretty well. Uh, and um, yeah, it, it's pretty nice, a good place to start. Uh, compared to something like Siamese networks, which we talked about on Wednesday, um, it's actually extremely similar to Siamese networks, especially if you're using class labels as, um, as your positives and negatives. And you can essentially think of it as Siamese networks from the standpoint of uh, if, if this distance in your embedding space is small, then classify the examples as being the same class. Otherwise, classify them as being in a different class. Um, really, the key difference between this triplet loss and Siamese networks is that when you use this triplet loss to learn a representation, you're going to be learning this kind of metric space, this representation space from which you can measure the distance between examples. Um, whereas the Siamese networks were only just learning a classifier, and it was just giving you the probability that they were correct or not, rather than a representation where you can measure these kinds of distances. Cool. Um, now, one thing that's, that comes up in this, um, with this, this loss function is that the negatives, um, choosing good negatives is difficult. Uh, and in particular, if you're in your embedding space and you sample a negative that's already very far away, then you're just going to have zero loss at that, at that space, and you won't actually be learning anything from that negative. And so um, you really want to try to find negatives that are difficult. Uh, one thing that you could do is what's called hard negative mining, where you explicitly search for negatives that are closer and use those negatives to actually allow it to continue to learn and continue to getting, getting good gradients from this loss function. Um, but the, we can also just basically, um, essentially, instead of just sampling one negative, we can sample multiple negatives and incorporate that into the loss function as well. Um, and this gets at the question that was asked before, which is, what if I don't want to contrast against one thing? What if I want to contrast against multiple different things? And so um, the second version of the loss function that will look like, um, the second version of the loss function is something that is going to do more of an n-way classification rather than these binary comparisons. Uh, and so instead of thinking about just having one negative, we're also going to think about having multiple other negatives. And essentially, what, we'll, what we're going to want to be able to do is classify among the turquoise and, and pink and yellow and, and uh, salmon colored dots, which of those is the positive and which one is the negative, or which one is the negative. 
Um, and so if we want to perform that kind of classification, uh, it's going to look a lot like a softmax. So we can measure the distance between the positive and the anchor uh, and the negative in the anchor or, or the negatives in the anchor and what our um, kind of the probability that an example will be um, the positive will be something like e uh, to the negative distance between x and x plus divided by um, basically a softmax. So we're just going to exponentiate and normalize these distances where we are dividing by the distance between um, the anchor and each of the negatives. And so um, this basically gives you the probability that x plus is a positive example rather than being a negative example. And when you actually then compute the loss for this, uh, oh, actually, sorry, the, these should technically, I guess, be f of x. Um, or equivalently, you could write these as uh, d of z or d of z and d of z plus and d of z and d of z minus. Um, so d will just um, correspond to either the Euclidean losses before or um, something like negative cosine similarity. Um, and then what the loss function looks like is um, this is a probability. We'll just minimize the negative log probability. So we'll take the log of this and minimize this with respect to theta. Yeah? They're summing over the negative examples. Oh, yeah, sorry. This is summing over the negative examples. And so, yeah, great catch. So this is over n, and then this is um, z minus n. Yeah, so we need to know, during training, we need to know what the positives and negative examples are. Yeah. Um, we don't a priori know how good of a negative they are, but this loss function will, um, will basically take into account all of them. Yeah. Uh, could we also sum over all the negative examples using the tri triplet loss? Yeah, so um, the question was, can we also sum over all the negatives using the triplet loss? Um, this actually ends up being very, very similar to doing that. So uh, if you actually write this out um, with the log, uh, the, numer the numerator will become log of e to the negative distance, and so, or negative log of e to the negative distance. And so you, this actually just becomes d of z and z plus. And then with the denominator, you get something like, um, plus log of sum of e to the negative distance of z and z minus. Um, and so you have a log sum x pure, but um, if you basically think of the, the log and the e canceling out, this is basically just like summing up the distances there. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't get that. Can you please re explain like, what we're trying to achieve here? Yeah, so the question was just um, the the question was, can we just basically take the triplet loss and just add up all the negatives? And what I was simply saying is that this, is, this loss function is actually already very similar to the triplet loss, but where you sum over the negatives here. Um, and so the question is, why don't we just do something like uh, this? And this loss is actually already doing something a lot like that, except instead of summing, we're going to do a log sum of x. Oh, sorry, yeah, what is the loss function doing itself? So, um, yeah, there's a few different kind of intuitive ways to think about this loss function. Um, one is, is very similar to the triplet loss, which is that it's pulling together the things, the positive and the anchor, and pushing apart or maximizing the distance between the anchor and the negatives. Um, the second intuition that you can think of it as is basically classifying um, whether or not an example is a positive example or a negative example given the anchor. Um, and so this is, um, this is, looks a lot like a softmax uh, where um, your logits correspond to this negative distance between uh, the example, your example and the anchor. Yeah? I, I 
you guys still just have a hard time grasping why um, the top is positive and the bottom is summing over negative examples? Like the, I'm um, sorry, for this loss function on the, like, yeah, it's, it says like Z, Z plus on top, but we're summing over the negative examples um, for the bottom part, and I, I, I'm not sure why that's the case. Yeah, so the, well, so, I guess one other form of this loss function that I could mention is one where you you just sum over all the examples on the bottom. And so you also add something where the, the positive example also comes on the bottom. I don't know if that makes more sense to you. Um, so yeah, this is also a version that you can do. Uh, this is, I think this version actually I think is what is done in this first paper, whereas in the second paper they actually didn't include this. Um, and I think that the intuition, perhaps for not including it, is that um, is that you really only want to push apart the um, you really only want to push apart the anchor and the negatives. You don't really want to push apart the anchor and the positive. And this denominator is basically pushing them apart. Yeah. Do you have any knowledge about the class of Z? Um, so the question was, do we have any knowledge about the class of Z? Uh, in the unlabeled case, you don't have any knowledge about the class um, of any of the examples. Yeah, so the question is, um, why would we then want the anchor to be closer to Z plus versus Z minus? Um, this comes down to how we sample positives and negatives. Um, and so on the next slide, I'll talk about how we sample it. Yeah. Going back to like hard and negative mining, could you like interpret that as adversarial paradigm, where like you're trying to find the hardest examples and you're trying to push them hard? Yeah. So the question is, can we interpret hard negative mining as a form of adversarial loss? And yeah, exactly. So basically, um, if you're the way that it would look like in the case of the triplet loss, for example, is you find the negatives that um, maximize this loss function rather than minimize those, and specifically pick those. And so in some ways, it is a form of an adversarial or, or, or a form of an adversary. Cool. Um, so here's the loss function um, just kind of written out on the board. Um, I talked a little bit about how this is, in some ways, a generalization of the triplet loss to multiple negatives. Now, um, let's actually walk through one algorithm that explicitly walks through also how we sample the positive and negatives. And I think that that should help um, clear, out, clear up what has been, clear up some of the questions that have been asked. So um, the input, input to this algorithm is just a set of examples x, just unlabeled examples. And so what the SimClear algorithm does is it samples a mini batch of those examples. So it samples n of those examples. And to generate positives, it's going to augment those examples with some augmentation function. And so um, here we're sampling some images, which, um, which are our mini batch of examples. And we're going to augment each of those examples twice to get um, x tilde and x tilde prime. Uh, and so, for example, the augmentations here correspond to changing the color, cropping in different ways, um, and, uh, and, and distorting or flipping and so forth. And so, for example, we take uh, our example, then we augment in two different ways to get, and do that for every example in our mini batch. Then once we have these augmentations, we're going to embed our augmented examples into our embedding space. So this corresponds to just running each of these augmented examples through our encoder f theta. And then um, from there, the positives are going to correspond to augmentations of the same image. And the negatives are going to correspond to augmentations of different images. And so the things that we're going to try to bring together are these augmentations of the same image. And the things that we're going to try to push apart are basically everything else in the batch. So this is one way to generate positives and negatives. There's also other ways to generate positives and negatives that we'll talk about. Um, on a future slide. And so intuitively, we don't know the classes of these images, but um, we do know that if we design good augmentations, then the augmented versions, these are actually very different images, 
but they have the same class because they are generated from the same image. Um, and likewise, these have, um, these have different, different classes and so forth. Um, as was mentioned before, it's possible that you'd also sample a chair in this batch, and you might end up pushing apart uh, other chairs. Uh, that's OK as long as, the, um, as, long as you're, uh, not every example you're pushing apart is also a chair. You could also think of this as doing something, a form of more fine-grained classification, where you're basically trying to discriminate different instances rather than different classes. Did that answer your question? Yeah? So eventually, this kind of thing will lead to uh, an embedding space where even if there are two, even the class, let's say, is a chair, and if we had two different images of chairs, so they might be separate. But the relative distance between two chairs would be lesser than the relative distance between a chair and a dog. Yeah, exactly. So the result of this algorithm should be um, an embedding space such that chairs are closer to each other than chairs and dogs. Uh, and part of that also relies on your augmentation function. And ideally, your augmentation function will generate other things that look like chairs. Uh, and so by pulling together those things, it will make it more difficult for the network to push apart um, an example of a different chair um, because you have because you have to have these have a similar representation. Yeah. Could you explain the choice why to augment twice and train only on augmented examples as opposed to augmenting once and using your original data? Yeah. So you could also just augment once um, and basically use the unaugmented un example as the anchor and the augmented example as as the positive. Um, one thing that this does give you is it gives you more negatives um, and, and more, more anchors and more positives. And so uh, if you have a good augmentation function, I think that um, augmenting twice and using the augmented examples both as anchors and positives and negatives um, should work well. I would also expect that if they include some of the original examples as, as positives, anchors, and so forth, or basically have the identity function be part of your augmentation class, um, that would also be a very reasonable choice. Yeah. If the identity is not a part of the augmentation set, isn't it like, like isn't the natural limit outcome distribution for the encoder kind of because it's only been trained on augmented samples which are like quite different from the natural image? Yeah. So the question was if the identity function isn't in your augmentation class, then like will these images be out of distribution in comparison to these images? Um, in general, these augmentation classes are designed such that they are exhaustive and that they c cover a, a much wider space than the original space. Um, and such that they aren't completely disjoint from the original space. And so um, in practice, that ends up not being an issue if you design your augmentations well. But um, it does mean that when you design your augmentations, you shouldn't design it to, to basically be disjoint from your original space. Yeah. So we're not embedding the original examples at all? Yeah, in this case, we're not actually, well, insofar, if, if identity is included in your augmentation class, then we are. But um, if it's not, then we're not actually doing that. Yeah. So if this is completely unsupervised, then can't we accidentally sample like two dogs instead of a dog in a chair? Yeah, so um, if this was completely unsupervised, can't we accidentally sample two dogs rather than a dog in a chair? And, and yes. Uh, the, this relies on the fact that, um, that kind of sampling two dogs is less likely than sampling a dog and something else. Um, it also relies on the fact that when you augment, you will create um, You'll create things that you have to push together, and that will make it harder to push apart two dogs um, than it is to push apart a chair and a dog. Cool. And so just to finish out the algorithm, we talked about attracting and repelling, attracting things of the same image, augmentations of the same image, and repelling augmentations of different images. Um, what this ends up looking like is once you embed into your Z space, then in this case, they're using cosine similarity to compute the distances between all of the different pairs of augmented examples. And what the loss function ends up looking like is um, basically exactly what we have written on the board here, where we take the distance between, um, between the two augmented versions of the same image. So that's going to be z and z plus. Um, here it's written as zi tilde and zi prime tilde. Um, so the i is the same. That means that they're from the same original image. 
And then the denominator is over examples that are um, that are uh, of um, of different initial images. And so those are an augmentation of one, one image versus an augmentation of another image. Yeah. Doesn't this loss function or algorithm kind of assumes a sort of balance between classes? Because if there's a huge imbalance, this might not work. Yeah, so the question is, does this algorithm assume that your unlabeled data is unbalanced? Uh, and in particular, if it's unbalanced and you have like a ton of dogs and only a small number of chairs, then maybe it wouldn't work well. Uh, that's a great question. I don't know of any, I don't know of any works off the top of my head that have analyzed that, although I vaguely remember some works showing that in general these algorithms can work um, much less well if your data is not balanced. And this is actually a really important um, thing to keep in mind because data sets like ImageNet are balanced because we know the labels of the data set, or, or they're, they're more balanced because we know the labels. But in cases where we don't know the labels, we have no way of telling if they're balanced or not because we don't know the labels. Um, and so the, um, yeah, it's in general, in, in practice, when putting these algorithms um, into, into practice, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, if you ask on Ed, I could also potentially try to point you to things that have specifically looked at unsupervised learning with imbalanced data. Cool. Um, and so you apply this process iteratively to update your encoder. And once you have your encoder, you can then either train a classifier on top of that representation or fine tune the entire network. One other design choice I'll mention, um, it's not kind of written in the equations, but the, uh, the Sinclair paper found it pretty helpful to, um, to actually use the representation right here as your pre-trained representation rather than the one right here. Uh, and that means that there's this kind of additional projection head that's taking the representation and projecting it into another space and then doing, um, doing the compare and contrast in that other space. Uh, and they found that this, this made performance um, somewhat better. You could imagine that it gives a little bit more flexibility to the network, although it also introduces additional hyperparameters in determining like where should this representation be in the network. Yeah. Uh, about the loss function, I see a same that I mean, the two, two samples, and uh, different, I, uh, I mean, I, I include J, uh, they come from the uh, different, different class of group, because uh, I'm thinking, for example, for example, in, in instance, suppose an image, maybe in the first and second, uh, both are for a similar cat, right? But in, the, in this formula, they still want to, I mean, uh, make the distance larger between these two, so. Uh, yeah. So the denominator here is always examples that have, always augmentations of different examples, although they may be examples of, um, of the same class, which we had mentioned before. Um, and ideally that happens with low, lower probability than examples with, uh, of the same, or of different classes. Yeah. Except that the layers before the final layer actually uh, provide like, uh, had a good performance for this algorithm. So, does UNET, can UNET perform better for this contrastive algorithm? So, the question is can UNET perform better for these contrastive algorithms? Uh, oh. So, we'll talk more about architectures that reconstruct the input in the Wednesday lecture. Um, I don't think you necessarily need something like a UNET here because this representation doesn't need to be this, like, a very large image. Um, it can be, it can still be much lower dimensional or, or lower dimensional. Simple one, but unit light architecture. Yeah, I mean, you could also, yeah, imagine having like skip connections here, for example. Yeah, I think that you could, you could imagine doing something like that. I guess, I don't know of any papers that do that, um, but my intuition would say that that could be bad from the standpoint of like, it could just completely ignore this part and just use the representation, like use the information through those skip connections to do the contrastive learning. Um, but that's, that's somewhat speculative and I, I don't know of any papers that do that. Cool, so um, how will these algorithms actually work for um, learning representations? So the, um, here are some results from the paper from the algorithm that we just went over. 
And here they're comparing to ImageNet classification, uh, the top five accuracy. And they're looking at if you only use 1% of the ImageNet labels or 10% of the ImageNet labels. Uh, and here, 1% corresponds to about 12.8 images per class, and 10% corresponds to about 128 images per class. Um, and so once you get down to 1%, you're um, almost in the few shot learning regime, or possibly you could consider that in the few shot learning regime if you kind of have 10 to 15 examples per class. Um, and we're comparing to a baseline that only trains on su with supervised learning on those labeled examples as well as some semi-supervised learning methods and some other representation learning methods. And the results show that um, first you get really substantial improvements over just supervised training from scratch. You go from, in the 1% case, from 48% accuracy to 85% accuracy, which is pretty significant. Um, and you also see pretty significant improvements over other semi-supervised and, and unsupervised methods. Uh, and this, um, we see this kind of especially as, as being the case in the 1% label setting. Uh, so for example, in comparison to um, well CPC, which is another contrastive method, um, we see about a 7% performance improvement. Um, compared to big BIGAN, you see a 30% improvement, and, and so forth. Um, so these methods work pretty well. And overall, 85% accuracy on ImageNet is, uh, I feel like, not too shabby. Um, and it's nice that we can get that while using only 1% of the labels in the data set. Yeah? Oh, yeah. What does the 2x and 4x mean? So um, ResNet 50 is the standard ResNet 50 architecture. 2x means that the width of the hidden layers is 2x larger. And 4x means that it's 4x larger. So it's just a larger network. Um, and we, we see that it does better with larger networks. So what about when using 10% of the labels? What about when using 10% of the labels? Yeah, so we see that the performance, um, it also does quite well in the 10% setting. The, um, the performance improvements are somewhat smaller, and there's a semi-supervised method that gets 91.2, whereas this gets 92.6. Um, but it is still um, kind of the best method out of, um, out of compared to the methods that were state-of-the-art in 2020. Yeah. Do you think it's saying that you only get 12.8 Im labeled images, but you also get other images that are unlabeled, or that this is only 12.8 images? And oh, labels? sorry. Yeah, they're using the entire unlabeled, the entire ImageNet data set as unlabeled, and then they're only using 1% of the labels. Yeah. Other any results from how does this generalize? So now we train to, uh, we pre-train the network, and we know, we also train it to the same images that we pre-trained it. So. Yeah, so the question is, do, are the representations useful beyond just ImageNet classification? Do the representations generalize well? Uh, the short answer is they do generalize to some degree, and we'll see some results um, in, towards the end of the lecture on that. Cool. Um, and then there's one other experiment that I think is actually quite important in the Simclair paper that was looking at um, not just performance, but how performance varied with the number of training epochs and the batch size. And the results are here. So um, the x-axis is the number of training epochs, or how long you're training for. And the different bars within each of those correspond to the batch size, with the blue on the left being the smallest batch size of 256, which is still a decently large batch, and um, the, the bar on the far right being a batch size of 8,192. And um, it's important to train for 600 plus epochs. Uh, I think this isn't too surprising in unsupervised learning settings because you, um, you need to learn a lot about the data. Um, one thing that I think is, is perhaps more important to note here is that it requires a large batch size. So if you train on with a batch size of 256, um, that does a lot worse than if you train on a batch size of 1,000, for example. And that difference is, can be um, if you train for a really long time, that difference is only 2%. If you train for a shorter amount of time, that difference can be um, more than 5%. Yeah. Any intuition behind why does it need that? Yeah, so why does it need a large batch size? Um, so we'll talk about this both intuitively and more mathematically. So one way to interpret um, interpret the contrastive loss function is basically 
you're trying to classify between, um, classify kind of one image from all the other images in the data set. And the, um, you can sort of think of this kind of, the denominator of this loss function is trying to sum over all the other examples in the data set. You're trying to classify between one example and everything else. Um, and in this summation right here, uh, the examples, the negatives that have the smallest distance are really going to dominate this sum um, because we're, we're exponentiating here. And so something that has a distance of say like 0 0.01 versus a distance of 10, um, because we're exponentiating this, this is going to play a much like e to the negative 0 0.01 versus e to the negative 10. This is a much, much um, larger number. And so this is going to be play a much larger role in the summation right here. And this means that um, the, um, because these examples with a really small distance are dominating, if you're subsampling and, and having a much a smaller batch size, then you might miss the examples that actually dominate that loss function. Um, and so you're not actually going to get a very good estimate of your loss function if you're missing the examples that actually have like played the largest role in this summation. Um, so that's that's part of the intuition. Um, and then more mathematically, if we want to think about this, um, let's uh, hmm, let's think about whiteboard space. So. I guess this is, well, maybe. So this is our loss function right here. Um, I'm gonna also remove this just because this is what CB, or this is what SimClear does. Um, so this is our loss function. Um, you can essentially think of as, think of what we do when we subsample uh, as sort of bringing the summation outside of the log. Um, and I guess specifically, um, maybe one, one thing to first note is that in normal supervised learning, we subsample all the time, and it's not a problem. Uh, and so, and it's totally fine to have small batches. And the reason for that is our kind of typical loss function might be something like log probability of y given x, where this is kind of a summation over x comma y. And when this is our loss function, if we, um, if we subsample and sample a smaller batch of x and y, we'll still, in expectation, get the correct gradient. Now, things are a little bit different when we actually try to subsample from this summation right here. Uh, and in particular, if we write out this loss function, um, it ends up looking like, uh, first, the distance, or yeah, the distance between z and z plus, this is all fine, um, plus the log of the sum over n of uh, e to the negative d of z and z n minus. And um, the challenge here is right now this summation is inside of the log. And essentially, when we sample mini batches, what we're doing is we are saying that, well, maybe this is like approximately equal to uh, d of z of z plus, plus a sum over um, our mini batch times log of sum over kind of n in our mini batch of e to the negative d of z comma z n. So this is really what we're optimizing when we do mini batch sampling, because instead of sampling all of the negatives in our entire training data set, we're sampling a mini batch of them. Uh, and now there's a question of okay, what what actually happens? Like, what's the relationship between these two equations? And there's something called Jensen's inequality that's actually super useful. Um, and one of the things that Jensen's inequality can tell us is it tells us that. Um, log sum of x, I always forget which way it goes, um, is greater than or equal to the summation of log x. Let's rewrite this. And so what this means is that it means that when we 
take the summation on the outside, that gives us a lower bound compared to when it's on the inside. And so that means that this approximation right here, when we actually are doing this sort of mini batch sampling, uh, we're getting a lower bound on our original objective. And that means that uh, when we actually minimize this objective, we're actually minimizing a lower bound on our original objective. Uh, and it's not good to minimize lower bounds on things because then you may not actually be minimizing your original objective. Uh, and so that's, what, that's, I guess, some additional intuition for why having a larger batch size is helpful because basically um, we're not actually getting a bound on our objective and so if we sample something closer to our original data set, then we're actually gonna come closer to optimizing our original objective. Any questions on that? Yeah. Could we also control somehow how close is the, this whole part is the bound? Um, the question is, is there a way to control how tight the bound is? Um, I mean, you can, like, one thing that you could do is just sample your whole data set rather than sample mini batches, although that's sort of what we were trying to get away from, um, or sample larger batches. So, I mean, that's kind of why larger batches make sense. Um, I don't know of any way to, to, to make it tighter, but if you do, let me know. <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, the kind of summary is that in normal mini batch deep or normal mini batch supervised learning, the summation is already on the outside, and we're all good. And so we can estimate this with mini batching. When the summation is on the inside of a log, uh, then mini batching that is not really kind of the correct thing to do. But it's, we do it anyway because that's what deep learning is like. So and then I also wanted to go through kind of solutions to requiring a large batch size. So um, one thing that you could do is instead of, uh, instead of trying to sample your entire data set at every single iteration, you can basically store the representations from the previous batches with something that looks a lot like momentum. Uh, this is not exactly correct because your encoder is going to be changing over the course of training. And so if you store those previous representations, they're going to be a little bit stale, but it allows you to somewhat decouple the batch size from, um, from this estimate. It allows you to get away with smaller batch sizes because you're basically accumulating batches over multiple iterations. Um, and this is called momentum contrast or MOCO, and they were able to get good results with a mini batch size of 256. Um, another thing that you can do that was um, proposed in the literature is instead of having any negatives whatsoever, uh, simply try to predict the representation of your image under a different augmentation. And so this is kind of more of a predictive method. It's called bootstrap your own latent. Um, it actually doesn't require any negatives. It just requires examples of positives. And when they plotted performance with respect to batch size, they found that it dropped off um, much less, especially up until 256 in comparison to the SimClear method. Um, and so it's more resilient to batch size, although it's something that's also um, doesn't have some of the kind of nice contrastive interpretation that we've talked about so far. Um, and then overall, in terms of the performance of these methods, uh, if you actually look at how good they are in terms of self-supervised learning for ImageNet accuracy, uh, we see that, like some of the papers that we covered were from a couple years ago, uh, but they really remain near state of the art for self-supervised pre-training. Um, and in particular, you can see MoCo v3 is, um, is like very close to the state of the art. I haven't actually looked at what is exactly the state of the art, so I'm not sure. It may also be a contrastive method or maybe something that's a little bit different. Yeah. If you lost a weird like loss over the log sum it's it's the whole entire data set, right? So can't we just try to get some of like some log HP of some samples and then assume that it's stochastic? It will be an upper bound, right? If we instead of like 
Bring it back. Instead of going this way, uh, can we just like take the log sum exp into sum of log exp over the entire data set, which will be the upper bound of the, on the loss function, and then just sample patches from that and say that it is under expectation going to be much to the same thing. Um, so you're saying that why, like, why do we have this loss function in the first place? Like, why not have the sum outside of the log, or? If you have sum outside of the log, then it could be an upper bound of this loss function. That is correct, right? Um, if you move the sum outside of the log, then it becomes a lower bound, um, according to Jensen's inequality. So if the sum is on the outside, it's a lower bound in comparison to if it's on the inside. Yeah. And unfortunately, like, sometimes I wish Jensen's inequality went the other way. Um, but. Yeah. Most of, the, sorry, most of the images over here are from ImageNet, which only has one object per image. But would the sampling approaches be applicable when we even apply multiple objects in the image where real world images would actually have that way? Yeah, so the question was a lot of ImageNet images just have one example or one object in the image. Uh, and would this work if you have multiple objects in an image? Um, the I guess I don't know of any like specific detailed experimental studies on that, but I'll show um, a couple instances where contrastive learning has been used in settings outside of ImageNet, and th that might provide some um, kind of some answer to your question. Cool. Um, and so, I guess moving towards that to some degree, um, these methods have been really good for visual categorization, things like ImageNet, uh, and. One challenge that comes up is that um, we've mostly been focusing on augmentations, and there's a lot of scenarios where we don't have a good like hand-engineered augmentation function that we can use for these methods. Uh, and even in those cases, the general framework of contrastive learning can still be very useful. Um, and so one, kind of alluding to something that came up earlier, you can actually try to learn the augmentation function uh, and this is a really cool paper that actually basically formulated um, an adversarial optimization where for your augmentation function, you tried to optimize it in a way that maximized the contrast of loss. Um, of course, if you do this in a completely unbounded space, then it will just give you arbitrary images out. Um, but what you can do is you can say that that augmentation function, it can only change the image by a small amount within some L1 sphere. Uh, and uh, this paper was actually competitive with SimClear on image data, which means it was able to find augmentations that were as good as the hand-engineered aug augmentations. Um, and it was also able to get good results on domains that aren't images, so domains like speech data uh, and, and sensor data. Um, cool. And then one of the things that we had mentioned earlier is instead of using augmentations, we could use um, Basically, our positives could be frames in a video that are nearby in time, and the negatives could be things that are further away in time or from other videos. Uh, and there have been a number of papers that have done something like this, and they've been able to get good results on tasks like robotics tasks. Uh, and so um, in this paper, the, um, you can take a, basically a data set with a ton of diverse videos of humans, um, do this sort of time contrastive learning where you pull together frames that have similar representations and push apart frames that have different representations. Um, and there was also an additional loss that sort of did a form of contrastive learning between videos and language. And it found that if you use this to pre-train a representation, um, you can give a robot 20 demonstrations or less than 10 minutes of supervision and get a, um, a policy that looks uh, something like this. Uh, get a, gets around 60% success rate on putting lettuce in a pan, uh, and 40% success rate on folding a towel. Um, and then the last thing I'll highlight is um, this isn't really fully self-supervised, but you can also apply contrastive learning between images and text. And um, what this looks like is you learn a representation of the images, you learn a representation of the text. If you have data that tells you whether or not, that basically kind of captions an image, then you can tell it that captions um, and images should go together, and images and other captions, or yeah, images and other captions should be pushed apart. Um, and so this is the key idea behind a model called CLIP, uh, and it is actually a, a really performant model, um, and it can it gives you very useful representations. It also can give you very good zero-shot classification performance. 
So on ImageNet, it was able to um, give you ImageNet accuracy that matches a supervised ResNet. Uh, but even more interestingly, if you give it images that don't look anything like ImageNet, like sketches um, or um, this more adversarial ImageNet data set, it's able to get performance that's much higher than something that is trained in a supervised fashion on ImageNet. Yeah. Would it also be because they had massive amounts of data? Yeah, so are these results um, because of the magic of contrastive learning or is it because of the data set? Um, certainly the data set plays a huge role here uh, and the, um, the diversity of the data set that is given will help it be able to do well on these kinds of things. Um, that said, there are a number of works that have kind of tried to ablate the role of self-supervised learning versus the data set and have found that things that are um, more self-supervised or more um, kind of sim more similar to something like CLIP do better than something that's trained in a purely supervised fashion. Cool. Um, so to summarize contrastive learning, uh, it's a very general and effective framework. Uh, and we've seen how it can be used to, con to compare and contrast lots of different things. Uh, one thing that's nice about it is that you only need an encoder, um, F data of X. You don't need a generative model of your data. And this means that you can probably get away with a smaller model than if you had used a generative model. Um, the other um, thing that can be viewed as a pro is if you have some domain information like augmentations, that can be incorporated into the algorithm to generate other positives. Um, the challenges is that negatives can be hard to select. Uh, and as a result, it often requires a large batch size. And so this is a little bit at um, kind of the kind of other side of the coin with respect to the generative modeling not being required. You can usually get away with a smaller model, but you need a larger batch size oftentimes. And so you might still need a large amount of GPU memory, for example, to train these kinds of models. Um, and then the other challenge is that it, um, it has been most successful with augmentations, uh, like we talked about. And there might be domains where you don't have augmentations available. And there are a couple solutions for that, but it's something that is still an open area of research. Yeah? You said you don't need generative modeling, but is contrastive learning sort of a good pre-training regime for generative modeling? The question is, is contrastive learning a good pre-training scheme for generative modeling? Um, I guess I often view generative modeling as something that you do with data that's unlabeled. And so uh, if you're, and one of the nice things about unsupervised pre-training is you can get a lot of juice out of unlabeled data. And so if your task is already something that, um, that can be done with unlabeled data like generative modeling, then it may be that you don't need a good pre-training method because maybe you already have a lot of data that you can use. Um, I guess more specifically, I also, I don't know of any works that, that pre-train with contrastive learning and then fine tune on a generative modeling task, but um, it's possible that there are some works out there. Yeah. Can this, can this be combined with like fine tuning if for example, you have a multi-label problem, so you know different examples can either be in the same class or not, depending on the, the label that you're interested in? Can this be combined with fine tuning? So, um, so we talked about learning representations and then you do often fine tune the representation. You often put it like some sort of classifier on top of the representation and then you can fine tune end to end. Are you thinking about something other than that? Uh, I guess I'm thinking about the way that you would generate the embedding and whether you want to change that, you know? Yeah. So you could also imagine fine-tuning with the contrast of loss, uh, similar to how things like prototypical networks are doing classification with, with the, this kind of, like this is, looks very similar to a, a classification loss, and so you could fine-tune with something like that. Um, yeah, so you could certainly do something like that. The, definitely the default that I've seen the vast majority of, of work do is to free, either freeze the representation and put something on top of that, or additionally fine-tune end-to-end. Um, but I could certainly imagine that you could fine tune with a contrastive loss as well. And if you can fit your loss function in the form of something like a contrastive loss, you may actually do better than that other approach. Yeah. 
Cool, and then the last thing I like to talk about in the last seven minutes is how this relates to some of the meta-learning algorithms that we have talked about in class. Um, and as you might have guessed, um, some of these equations look a lot like the equations that we saw in the non-parametric few-shot learning lecture. Uh, and you can, in many ways, formulate an algorithm, um, a meta-learning approach that looks a lot like the contrastive approaches we've talked about today. And so um, if you're given an unlabeled data set, um, say you're doing something like SimClear where you generate positives and negatives by augmenting, then you can basically create a labeled data set where you create an image class by augmenting your example, and you create multiple examples um, from that class by augmenting it multiple times. Um, that will give you a data set for that image class, and then to create a task, what you'll do is you'll want to be able to classify between different image classes. Now, um, once you can, once you have this labeled data set, you can create tasks that actually just run your favorite meta-learning algorithm on this data. Um, and it turns out that there's actually a, a very kind of close mathematical relationship between doing something like this with an algorithm like prototypical networks and the SimClear algorithm that we talked about in lecture. Um, there, this, this paper in the bottom right goes in depth on that, um, but there are really two key differences um, and they're relatively small differences in my mind. Um, the first is that SimClear samples only one classification task per mini-batch, and usually meta-learning algorithms will sample a mini-batch of tasks. And the second difference is that um, SimClear, it, it's really gonna look at all pairs of negative examples, or, or all pairs of, um, yeah, all pairs of, of examples in your batch, whereas meta-learning only compares the query examples to the support examples and never compares and contrasts query examples with other query examples. Um, so in this way, you could perhaps view the SimClear class as being a little bit, the SimClear class as being a little bit more efficient with its batch, because it's going to compare and contrast everything in the batch. Um, but otherwise, these algorithms end up being extremely similar. Um, and they also end up doing something extremely similar in practice as well. So if you, um, here's just one experiment in that paper, you, take an unlabeled data set, I think they took the ImageNet unlabeled data set, they um, augmented with the SimClear augmentations uh, and compared using SimClear versus using this approach with prototypical networks and R2D2, where R2D2 is, a, um, is an optimization-based meta learner that has a number of kind of bells and whistles to it. Uh, and you see that when you then kind of pre-train these representations on ImageNet and then fine-tune them on these other image classification uh, problems, you see extremely similar performance between SimClear and prototypical networks. You also see very similar performance between SimClear and R2D2. Um, and in some cases, R2D2 is able to do uh, a little bit better as well. Yeah. Um, so far, the meta-learning um, methods you've seen are mostly few short. But this problem is a zero short problem. How does that? Yeah, so actually, this is actually not a zero-shot problem. So um, it's pre-training on it's pre-training representations with this approach, and then fine-tuning on the entire data set from the entire training data set from these data sets. And so the other difference that I sort of didn't mention on this slide is on the previous slide is that meta-training and, and the training time is very similar, but what happens at test time is actually a little bit different. So typically in few-shot learning, we um, We'll, like, we'll give it a few examples, embed them, and make a classification. Um, and actually, in this case, at test time, what they're doing is they're, they're learning the representation with better learning, and then they're just fine-tuning the whole network. Uh, and that's a little bit different from what we've been doing in the previous lectures. Uh, yeah, and so we're, they're really just comparing the representations that were learned rather than the specific few-shot learning approach that happens at test time. Yeah. So if I imagine the batch sampling, I think with meta learning one, they would have had like more samples instead of one sample, but a much smaller like number of samples per, per, per angle in a way. So how does that optimization compare like in terms of computer and convergence? Plan? Yeah, so the question was um, like how do we, like, the, like in meta learning like n and k, you choose n and k, choose, usually you choose an n that's maybe smaller than 256. Um, at least that, that's certainly what a lot of papers have done. Um, I can't remember exactly what they did in, in this paper. Um, 
if you happy to follow up on it or you could take a look at the paper and I'm guessing that they probably use something similar to 256 and so maybe the values of those hyperparameters do actually affect performance. Yeah. So this one in contrast to uh, they do augmentation, right? So if you assume that each class has uh, you augment, let's say, four or five samples for each class, so it's like a four, sh a four or five short training for that class in a way. So I wanted to ask, does mixing this two, so like when you have a supervised few short model, can we include contrast to rhythm into training meta learning approaches? Does it help? Yeah, so I guess first, I do think that it's very similar to one-shot learning because there's one positive and one anchor. Um, and generally, one-shot learning is harder than like five-shot learning. And so I would suspect that you get better representations from one-shot learning than five-shot learning. Um, the other question is, can you use contrastive learning? So, as an you do the training, but we don't specifically do anything with support samples or query samples. Like, we just compare the support and query but we don't do anything intra-support, like in, in the support right. space or query space. Does doing that in an unsupervised manner, does in, in using, introducing contrast of learning there, does it help in the performance? Yeah, so in Prototypical Networks, it does this sort of like aggregation in, in the case where you have more than one shot. Um, and the question is, if you do something like that and additionally enter, include elements of, of this, which I think would sort of be similar to training like both one shot and five shot in a way, um, because one shot is very similar to this. Um, does that help? And I, I could see that improving performance. And I think that the prototypical that works papers showed that actually sometimes one shot training can actually be better than five shot training when you test on five shot because you're training on something harder. Um, so we never actually train. We never actually get the information out of the support samples. Like we don't train them in between, like in unsupervised manner. And we also don't do anything with the query sample. Yeah. yeah. Build information just of the data. Right, right, yeah. So you could also use these augmentations um, in addition to the labels that we have in the meta training data set. Um, and that would be kind of like sort of like a semi supervised meta learning thing as well. And we'll probably talk about that a little bit on Monday next week. Cool. Um, so just to wrap up, um, we talked about contrastive learning. On Wednesday this week, we're going to be talking about another form of unsupervised pre-training, which are reconstruction-based methods. Yeah, so that's the rest of contrastive learning. Um, as a couple of reminders, uh, your project proposal is due on Wednesday, and the homework is due next Monday. <laughs>